later. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah 56. We're looking at Isaiah 56 and 57, title of our study this evening, A Lover of Strangers and Sinners. Isaiah 56 and 57, A Lover of Strangers and Sinners. You should know God is a lover of strangers. And we're going to see that so clearly tonight. If you're new to a study of scripture, we're studying one of the thicker and deeper Old Testament books of prophecy, Isaiah. We've worked our way here from Genesis, and we will continue to the end of the Old Testament, Malachi. But we're here for now. And one of the things we notice as we've been walking through Isaiah is he hits on these major themes and topics. This section has a lot to do with our Lord's ministry as Savior. But it's important to know that God is a lover of strangers. And while we're not all strange, he's also a lover of sinners. And we are all sinners. And that's really our focus tonight as we'll study together and prepare our hearts to share in communion, to celebrate and commemorate the great price he paid to give us life eternal. Well, we begin then tonight with two commands followed by God's promise of deliverance and a deliverer. Then there's a beatitude promising blessings on all who obey his commands. Should sound familiar, comes up a lot. Those who keep, in this case, his Sabbath, abstaining from doing evil. Thus says the Lord, Isaiah 56, 1. Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name. Better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them as an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Well, he's addressing here then the foreigners and surprisingly the eunuchs. And and I looked it up and you think, okay, foreigner. In old King James, it was stranger. I mean, that's the word that was translated. So when you do word studies, unless you have a a newer concordance for the New King James or the NIV or the New, New American Standard or whatever you might be reading, well, it's going to say stranger, and that happens 35 times. It is translated alien as well, which there's good reason for it. But it's important to know that the foreigner the stranger, the alien were excluded from everything that God had laid out for his people unless, and this is a key to to really putting the whole thing together, or until, well, they connected with him through the nation of Israel. It's really a key to understanding what, was going on in the world at the time when God called Abraham. And it's something most of you will be familiar with because we often make reference to it. You know, in Genesis 12, in the midst of five promised blessings to Abraham, five I wills of God from the one who always makes good on his promises, he said he was going to bless all nations through Abram's seed. Now, it's important we pointed it out a couple weeks back. He said seed as of singular. We learned this in the New Testament, of course, and not seeds plural. So it's talking about blessing all nations through our Lord and Savior Jesus, through the promised Messiah, the anointed one. But there's something else. God did, in fact, intend to bless all nations through Israel as well. 
Now, that's not to say they did a great job at spreading the blessings, you know, spreading the wealth, the joy, the knowledge, but they were somewhat effective. In fact, in the seasons where they walked closely with God, well, they had a witness that, that rightly testified of who he was and what he was like and what he'd done and what he was doing. Now, the second thing is in Genesis 17, where Abe's now 99. By the way, he was 75 when God appeared to him and made those first promises, among them that he would be a great nation, which would require some children. And uh, at this point, still hadn't had not at least a child by uh, the promised bride, and that would be Sarah. So God appears, he reaffirms his plan to make Abram great, saying he'd make nations of him, plural, and kings would come from him, plural. And then he changes Abe's name and Sarai's name. Abe becomes, or Abram becomes Abraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. He institutes circumcision as a sign and a seal of the covenant. Every male child on the eighth day was to be circumcised. The same law existed, and, and, and track with me on this, because it's all coming back around to the idea of a foreigner and a stranger and an alien being loved by God. He's a lover of strangers. There was the same law was to be applied to his descendants physically, and those who were joined to him otherwise. Some of them were captured by them and became slaves to them. Others just wandered into the camp and wanted to know more about the God they served. There were a lot of different ways people connected with Abraham and his descendants. But listen, Exodus 12, 48, when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So get this, Israel had the law. It is one thing among others that separated them from all the world. But they, they didn't receive the law because they were special they became special because God gave them his law. But it wasn't so that they and they alone could know the will of God and the word of God and, and the God of the word. His intention is that anyone and everyone where his light was shining, and that light's pretty bright, by the way. He says that the heavens are testifying. They're shining everywhere on everyone, declaring the glory of God. When anyone anywhere sought out the true and living God, he would try to bring them, direct them to, well, Israel. This was the nation birthed by him and blessed by him and given his law and given his, his tabernacle and later his temple. So, so get it, the law that gave them circumcision, the, the, the feast and the festivals, including Passover, also applied to them. No uncircumcised person. You see, they started reading that like, well, we're the circumcised and they're the uncircumcised. But that was never God's intention. His intention was that others would come in and say, well, what do we need to do? And they'd say, well, you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the law of Moses. This is true all the way up to the time of Jesus. And then after Jesus some of them were still saying that, right? They're still preaching that because, hey, you got a lot of generations of this. Okay, there's more. In Exodus 22, 21, listen, he says this four times. I'll read them quickly to you for time's sake, but I'm laying a foundation I hope will help some of us see people around us, even those very unlike us through God's eyes. And, and that we'll have his heart for them. He says, you shall neither mistreat a stranger, Exodus twenty two twenty one, neither mistreat a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That was during their captivity there, of course. In, in Exodus 23, 9, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers 
in the land of Egypt. He's saying, you guys know what it feels like to be the outsider. So don't make the outsider feel the way you felt. In Leviticus 19.34, a part of the law itself, the stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you. Love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Is that interesting? Love your neighbor and even not your neighbor as yourself. That's what it's saying. So it's not like when Jesus says this, it was new. No, this has always been the heart of God. He went on in that passage to conclude that saying, I am the Lord, your God. And then in Deuteronomy 10, 19, he says, love the stranger. I love that. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Okay, you say, so what's that supposed to mean to us? Well, what I think he'd be saying to us is love the lost because you were lost. Love the ungrateful, you've been that. Love the, you know, well, whatever it might be. We haven't been all the things we shouldn't be, but all of us have been some of them. And so the point is, I can reach some people you might not. You can reach some people I might not. Why? Because you're just like those people, B.C. Before you got a hold of Jesus or Jesus got a hold of you, you meet people and you're like, I really relate to this person and don't like them. Have you noticed? We don't say it like that, but it happens. When we come across people that really bug us and rub us wrong, especially worldly people, oftentimes it's because they're just like what we used to be like. And it, it, it's like this, it's like a mirror and we don't like it because it's a mirror of what we were, not what we've become. But he's saying that's the reason you should love them. If you were deceived, and some of you were, some of you come out of cults or the occult or out of immorality or some other form of idolatry. And some of you have come out of drunkenness or the drug lifestyle. Fortunately, not all of you. We have a few sane and sober and, and you know, morally pure people here, and I'm grateful for them. But don't feel like you don't belong if that describes you even tonight. Maybe you said, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I haven't come out of those, and how, why is he even talking about them? Because we have, you see. God's delivered us from what we were to make us what he intended us to be. And so what he's saying is when you've been deceived and then you meet people, now that you know the truth, who are deceived, rather than looking down on them or thinking what's wrong with them, just have compassion on them. Such were some of you. That's how we live, you see. And, and if you're one of those fortunate few that God kept you from all those things, well, there's other people like you too. And you can reach them. And, and the point is, I meet people and, and they're like, you don't know what I'm going through. You've never been in the place I've been, you know. I'm homeless. And I'm like, well, I was that. It was by choice, but there sometimes is too. I left home when I was young and hitchhiked up to Berkeley. I just thought that would be fun. And I don't want to tell you how it all worked out because I don't want to mislead people, especially those who think, well, maybe I should try that. You shouldn't. <laughs> it's different times. And the point is, I made a lot of foolish mistakes. And when I meet people, they, they, you know, they see this. So they, they sort of make conclusions about me and who I might be and how I might have grown up not realizing that I grew up hard and went through a lot. And, and most of it, I would do anything to keep others from going through. And so my point is when I meet people like that, my heart breaks for them, I'm not looking down on them or judging them or thinking, well, I'm so much better than them. I can tell you this, I'm so much better off than I was back then but I've never ever felt better than because all my goodness is in Christ. All my righteousness is in Christ. Every good thing that happens to my life, it's him. And that the more you mature and the more you get that, the more useful and fruitful you become in your latter years for him. I say in your latter years because in the early years, most Christians are fruitful for the Lord. 
It's because you haven't figured out, you know, or, or not figured out that, that it, it's all the Lord. You, you just sense that God's done something radical and you can't wait to tell everybody. And it turns out that some of them will be glad to hear it and they'll respond appropriately to it. Well, just a couple other things then. Paul reminds us that we were those aliens. We were alienated before we came to Christ. We were strangers to God's covenants and to God's word and to God's love and to God's plan. Ephesians 4.17 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated. See, that's the word akin to aliens. They were alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Colossians 1.21, Paul says, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. You see, they came through the law, we came through Jesus. Well, in our passage then, verse 6, as he's dealing with the aliens and others, the sons of the foreigner, because it's foreigner here in, you know, my new King James, that's not just a great band with great vocals from the, the 80s. No, that's everybody foreign to Israel in the time where they were God's light and God's salt and God's witnesses on the earth. The sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer." Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Don't miss that. We often quote it. My house shall be called a house of prayer. The word, by the way, encompasses praise and petitions, you know, intercessions and just glorifying our Lord. It's the broadest possible concept. It isn't just bringing a list of concerns to the Lord. It's laying our heart bare before the Lord. But but listen, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And somehow they missed this part. They forgot this part for all nations. It was always in his mind's eye. I don't know what that phrase means, mind's eye. It's like a Mad Magazine picture in my head, and I'm like, I don't even, I shouldn't even use it. But anyway, God always envisioned all nations coming to him, worshiping at his temple. And here's the crazy, wonderful part. Though there's no time in history past where that's actually happened, we've been studying Revelation, and we know in the future all nations will come and worship there in Jerusalem, that all the world that survives the wrath of God and the tribulation and great tribulation will gather there during the millennium to worship our Lord. My house, a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel says, yet I will gather him to him others besides those who were gathered to him. He's saying, look, some of your brethren have been taken captive and and there's a whole world out there that's dead in trespasses and sin, deceived by the enemy of our souls, a whole world oblivious to my goodness and my mercy and my love and my plan. 
So he's saying, I'm going to gather your flock back and I'm going to gather others. Oh, it's such an important concept. There are two words here that could trip people up. I want to deal with them because they're important concepts, not just to Israel, not in that dispensation, but to Israel and anyone who wanted to connect with God through Israel. And remember at this point, that's the only way people were connecting. Circumcision set them apart privately. And uh, the Sabbath set them apart publicly, socially, observably. In other words, he said, if, if a Gentile comes and they want to worship me, they want to celebrate the Passover with you. They want to attend the feast and festivals and offer me burnt offerings. They can. But first they must be, we read it, circumcised. It was the sign in the seal of the covenant he made with Abraham. But that's not all, you see, because he said they also have to keep my Sabbath. And the Sabbath was something no one could tell if you were circumcised, but everyone could tell if you were keeping the Sabbath. Why? You weren't to walk further than you were supposed to. You weren't to light a fire. The, the, the Sabbath rules and regulations were very strict. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, important to know. But the Sabbath itself, 135 times it's mentioned. It was foreseen in Genesis as God rested on the seventh day. He blessed it and set it apart. So the seventh day is the Sabbath, was the Sabbath, will always be the Sabbath. Next, in the removal of the leaven, on the seventh day as they prepared to, to celebrate their memorial to the Passover, to God's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. Then in the daily gathering of the manna, because they were to gather every day except on the Sabbath, and God made provision on the sixth day that they could go out and gather double, and it would keep so that they would have food to get them through the Sabbath. Interesting, there were some who thought, well, if it keeps for two days here, then it will keep for two days Tuesday. But it turned out that didn't work. The stuff, you know, it stank and bred worms. And, you know, so they go in to get their, their, their breakfast and it's all full of maggots. And uh, it's like, I know that they were just eating, you know, the, the manna, but uh, I'm pretty sure even maggots don't, sound good if when you're on a pure manna diet and so uh but anyway never watch survivor don't want to watch survivor people have told me they eat maggots that's all i needed to know okay perfect thank you for the warning not watching it anyway they gather the manna daily but on the sixth day they gather double because the sabbath was a day of rest finally it was codified in god's law it was given to Moses on Sinai. Exodus 20, verse 8, listen to it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates nor your stranger so the Sabbath was for the Jew and for the Gentile who'd come and been circumcised and now wanted to celebrate and serve the Lord. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and we hallowed it, excuse me, and hallowed it. Well, it's important to note then that for Israel, circumcision in the Sabbath, they were absolute essentials. But before we shift from strangers to sinners, and understand all the strangers were sinners, but his focus will move from speaking about the strangers to speaking about the sinners. Um, I want to say don't worry at all about circumcision and don't worry at all about the Sabbath. Not arguing against, uh, you know, circumcision. And I'm not arguing against the day of rest. 
but I'm saying neither of those are required of us, not spiritually, not in order to connect with God, not in order to please God. The Sabbath was given to Israel. Circumcision was given to Abraham and passed on to Israel. Listen, Colossians 2.11, you'll like this. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He says, God's done for us spiritually what they had a mere sign of physically. The circumcision was supposed to be a sign of their obedience to the Lord and their intention to raise their children who were circumcised on the eighth day in the Lord. So he's saying, we have that in Jesus. And he goes on to say, Colossians, make note of it and go check it out later. Don't believe just because I'm saying it. I'm actually reading it so you can trust it. But but don't believe it because I believe it. Believe it because the Bible teaches it. Buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which were contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And we've often spoken of this, always in the context and reality for which it was given. Jesus had no charges of his own. They accused him falsely of blasphemy. That was the religious leader's charge against him, claiming to be one with God, claiming to be the son of God, claiming to be God the son, the savior of the world. They understood well what he was saying. And they crucified him. Well, they handed him to Rome because they didn't crucify, not Israel. They would have stoned a blasphemer, but they didn't have the right to take a life in that season. Sometimes they got away with it. Rome sometimes backed off. This was a season, a holiday season. Rome was on high alert, you know, and and so that wasn't going to happen. The point is they hand them over to Caesar. They push the envelope until Caesar gives up and sends him to be crucified. And and on the cross, they couldn't put what he'd done because he hadn't done anything. And and this is saying that the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, the sins we were guilty of were nailed to his cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So he says, let no one judge you in food or drink, or regarding a festival, or new moon, or Sabbaths, listen, which are a shadow of things to come. What are a shadow? The food and drink, the offerings, and the things they they partook of and didn't. The festivals, the feasts, the new moons, the Sabbaths, are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now, this should make perfect sense to us. You can't have a shadow unless you have an object. The object is Jesus. The shadow just says there's an object. But when you see a shadow, depending on where you are and how you're feeling, I'm a little bit edgy now and then. And so uh, too much coffee probably. But, uh, but, you know, sometimes I startle. And so, and, you know, I don't know if you knew, you could be startled by a shadow. I don't know if you're aware. You could be startled by your own shadow if you didn't know it was your shadow. That's really too much coffee. I'm not saying this happens to me all the time. I'm just saying. It's important to see it. It, If there's a shadow, there's an object. That's the point. And so Jesus is the object. We, We don't need circumcision spiritually. We practice it, I think, as a culture uh, medically, but but has nothing to do with our spirituality because we're not becoming Jews now that we're Christians. There are actually some who believe that now that you're Christian, you need to connect through Israel to the Lord. It's the opposite. Israel needs to connect with us through Jesus because he's the hub. 
we're all just spokes. And if you make anything but Jesus the hub, you messed up the whole thing. Well, the rest of our study is going to be devoted to two kind of sinners. I'm hoping that, that there's only one of these kind here. But if there are both, then before we leave, let's make sure we all leave as the repentant kind, the kind that's been confronted by the Lord and convicted by the Lord and understands what he did for us. So we recognize, okay, we're all sinners. We were all alienated. Israel was alienated before God created the nation, birthed and blessed it. He chose a man to bring forth the nation, to bring forth another man, to bring forth the church. So you have Abe and Israel and Jesus and the church. But it's all about getting us to the Father ultimately. So there are religious hypocrites and there are repentant sinners. Actually, there are other kinds of sinners. Some people are not religious at all. So they're just sinners and happy to be sinners for a season. But I've been reading the Proverbs and it says that the sinners are miserable. And, and somehow they, they, you know, convince themselves otherwise. There are all sorts of ways to numb yourself to the reality of your life. But anyway, in our passage, the primary groups are religious hypocrites, who Jesus turns out not to be very fond of, by the way, still willing to forgive them, but pretty aggravated with them and you know you just don't see him aggravated I'm not sure that's even the right word it's righteous indignation I know those words I'm not sure no I I, I can say I have had that feeling when when someone's abused and I'm so angry that that I, I want to do something to them you know I, I want them to to feel pain that's righteous indignation and it's also the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, that keeps me from acting and ending up in jail. So then, you know, be, I know I'd have a ministry there, but I prefer to minister to you here <laughs> for so many reasons. But my point is, righteous indignation, if we see abuse and it's all around us, we see horrific sin, not just, we should feel bad for the sinner and at the same time hate what's happening. That's righteous indignation. And Jesus, he, he just, that, that gushes forth a few times in his ministry where he is so angry at what's taking place. One of them, not in our passage, but I just got to share it with you. And, and that's when he comes twice, early in his ministry and late in his ministry, to cleanse the temple. And remember, it was to be a house of prayer for all nations, and they had set up shop in the outer courts because you couldn't set up shop there in the inner courts. I mean, those were places of true spirituality. At least that's what was supposed to be happening there. But the outer courts are places where Gentiles could come and bring their offering. The places where the women could come, the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles. There were these various porticos or anyway surrounding the temple itself and they were a part of it but they weren't the the temple proper not the insiders if you will it was for the outsiders for the foreigners for the strangers for the alien that's where they set up camp and they were selling stuff some of it necessary. You know, if you traveled a great distance and you didn't want to bring a lamb for a sacrifice, but you had enough to offer a lamb, then you could bring money. But if you did, your money was no good in the temple. Although there was somebody there working in the court of the Gentiles, just happens, who would be happy to exchange your coins for ones that were acceptable at a sort of high exchange rate. And then, of course, they were selling lambs. You might actually make it there with a lamb, but they'd inspect your lamb and say, nah, this, this one's a dud. Or this, this one's a, no, it's not going to make it. No, it needs to be perfect. He only accepts perfect lambs. And so they would substitute a lamb 
they'd say, we'll take yours in on trade. We'll give you something for it. And then you give us some more. And here's the lamb that you can offer. So you give them back the lamb. You know what happens? You leave and they just take your lamb and sell it to the next sucker. And, and, and by sucker, I, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't even use that term because these people were coming to worship. They were trying to connect with God in the place, his house that was to be a house of prayer for all nations. That's why when Jesus came in and overturned the money changers' tables and he began to drive out those who were selling the animals with, with a whip, he said, my house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations. You've made it a den of thieves. That's true righteous indignation. They came to connect with God. They found people taking advantage of their desire. All you beast of the field, verse 9, come to devour. All you beast in the forest. This is interesting. Revelation 19, he calls the birds to a great dinner. Now he's saying, hey, beast, come and eat because there's a judgment brewing. His watchmen are blind. A watchman, by the way, a guardian of God's flock called here, well, blind, ignorant, dumb dogs, greedy dogs, shepherds who without understanding, I'll just, I'll read it to you. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They are greedy dogs which never have enough. They're shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his own territory. Come, one says. I'll bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. He's calling the spiritual leaders. That's who the watchmen were. Blind, ignorant, dumb, greedy, selfish, and foolish. And that's the best he had to say about them. It's like that, you know, you don't have to spare my feelings. Tell me what you really think kind of thing. Well, Jesus, you should know, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, even prostitutes, felt like they could come into his presence. Now, don't misunderstand he told every person as John had before him, they needed to repent in order to have a relationship with him. But he still received them. He received them as they were. And then he said, like to that woman they said was caught in adultery, where are your accusers? They've all gone. There are none. Neither do I accuse you. That's the, the forgiveness, the go and sin no more. That's the responsibility of the forgiven person. And today, too many people are saying, oh, God forgives all sin. Yeah, that's true. But he calls us to repent of all sin and to say, God, forgive me, knowing I'm just going to go straight back into it. Why even come? Why even ask? He, he, he's saying, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Well, Chapter 57, believe it or not, plenty of time for this because 90%, I'm just going to read it to you. It's it just, there's, there's nothing good. Well, there's a couple things good. I'm going to focus on them, but it's mostly bad. And I want to get our hearts back right for, for communion. The righteous, he says, perishes. Oh, this is good. I like this part. No, no, I do. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his own uprightness. Get this. This is heaven's perspective on the death of the righteous. This is heaven's perspective that it's not just a tragic loss of life. It may be an act of mercy by God, sparing them the evil to come, giving them peace and rest. Listen, mentioned, and you're aware of it, you couldn't possibly be oblivious to it. The things that are going on around the world as, as Christians are being beheaded, and not just Christians, anyone who doesn't want to convert and follow ISIS and their group or this group or that group, but, but get this, 
They're in Syria, a group of Christian workers. Pastor Jacob passed this one on to me, so I know it's, you know, been vetted and, and is legit. It talks about these Christian workers in Syria that were crucified and beheaded. So first they crucify them because that's a torturous, painful, shameful death. And then they behead them. And don't have time to read it to you. It's from October 1st, 2015. It's from Christian Aid Mission. You might ask Jacob about it. I'm sure he's got the, the website because he downloaded it. But, but it, there were 11 indigenous Christian workers there in Syria. They were given the option to leave the area and live. A 12-year-old son of a ministry team leader could have also spared his life by denying Christ. But anyway, it turns out none of them were willing to deny Christ. All of them were given opportunity. Just as we know Antichrist will, just as we know Caesar did in his day, just, just as we know Nebuchadnezzar did in his day, all of these, including that 12-year-old, just said, no, I worship Jesus and I will not. I will not convert. I will not deny him. And I'm thinking when I'm reading this, the righteous perishes and and no one takes it to heart. Merciful men taken away. The righteous taken away from evil, entering into peace, resting in their beds, each one walking in his own uprightness. Well, God's judgment, verses 3 through 12, on his rebellious, idolatrous, unrepentant leaders, as well as those who followed them. Understand, this is the these are the forerunners, because this is back in Isaiah, and it was happening in his day. These are the forerunners of those Jesus deals with in his day. He says, come here, you sons of the sorceress, you offspring of the adulterer and the harlot. Who do you ridicule? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and stick out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression, offspring of falsehood, inflaming yourself with gods? Under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys, under the clefts of the rocks. It sounds barbaric. They were offering their children on the rocks to Moloch. But listen, that's no different than the millions of babies who have been and are being and will be aborted. It there sounds barbaric. How could this be less barbaric in a time where we are so much more civilized. Among the smooth stones, verse 6, of the stream is your portion. They're your lot. Even to them you have poured a drink offering. You've offered a grain offering. Shall I receive comfort in these? On a lofty and high mountain you set your bed. Even there you went up to offer sacrifice also behind the doors and their posts. You've set up your remembrance for you've uncovered yourself to those other than me and have gone up to them. You've enlarged your bed and made a covenant with them. You've loved their bed when you saw their nudity. You went up to the king with ointment and increased your perfumes. You sent your messengers far off and even descended to Sheol. You are wearied in the length of your way, yet you did not say there's hope. You've not found, oh, you have found the life of your hand. Therefore, you were not grieved. And of whom have you been afraid or feared that you have lied and not remembered me, nor taken it to your heart? Is it not because I've held my peace from I'm old that you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your works for they will not profit you. Recall Revelation 20 this last weekend, the books are open and men are judged by the sins, the things they did, the works, their works written in the books. That's exactly what Isaiah is saying. God is saying here, I'll declare your righteousness and your works because their righteousness was unrighteousness and their works unholy. They will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. But the wind will carry them all away. A breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and inherit my holy mountain. 
This almost seems crazy, but it can't be because it's God, right? But he's saying, here's what you've done, and here's what you've done, and here's what you've done, and here's what you've done. And then he's saying, in spite of all of that, anyone who turns, anyone who trusts, anyone who repents, if you will, you'll possess your land. You'll inherit my holy mountain. After all the things he saw and said, God still leaves the door open for for sinners to repent, for Israel to come back to him. And one will say, heap it up, heap it up, prepare the way. Take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. They see the problem is outside them. The problem wasn't outside. The problem was inside. It was a heart issue, you see. Their heart was for the idol. Their heart was for immorality. Their heart was for drunkenness. Their heart was for anything and everything but our Lord. For thus says, verse 15, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. See, they knew. And we do too. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I will not contend forever, he says, nor will I always be angry for the spirit would fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and was angry. And he went on backsliding in the way of his, see it, his heart. He went the way of his heart. God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. They loved everything but the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. But he's saying, he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. Listen, there's no greater comfort than the comfort of his presence. In his presence, fullness of joy. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near. Do you see it? Yet one more time, he says, peace to the one far off and peace to the one who's near. There'd be an application tonight before we look at these last couple verses and pray and prepare our hearts for communion. You might have come in tonight feeling so close to the Lord and now you're a little disturbed. And and listen, I have no personal, okay, here's what I'm going to try to accomplish. The Bible says, warn the unruly and comfort the faint-hearted. I'm hoping that I've been able to do both of those things. But only God knows who's unruly here and who's in need of comfort. But I can tell you this for sure, that if you came feeling far from the Lord, well, you should leave feeling close to the Lord. And if you came thinking you were fine and now you're not so sure, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Make sure that your heart's right with him. Not just that you're not doing those things that other people do that you know you shouldn't do. That's a start. But that's not a relationship. That's just, hey, I'm not going to break the law anymore. It's a love relationship. That's what he's pleading for and why he died so that we could have that reconciliation and that relationship He says, I create peace, peace to him who's far off, the one who's, you know, an alien, a foreigner, a stranger, and to him who's near, the one who's connected, an insider, says the Lord, and I will heal him. After reminding us there's hope for the repentant, note, here's the only other option. The wicked, he says, are like the troubled sea. When it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Listen, tonight you're one or the other. 
He says you're either with him or, or you're against him. You're for him or you're against him. You're either cleansed from all sin or you're dead in trespasses and sin. And so all have sinned, all are sinners. The humble and the repentant will be restored. The haughty and the unrepentant will be condemned. Lord, I pray not one here will perish, but all would come to repentance. And I don't have to pray. If it's your will, none would perish but all come to repentance because we know that is your will. That's your passion, your desire, your heart that not one be lost to you. And Lord, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade now, we preach the simple message that's changed our lives, that you, Christ, died for our sins. You were buried and you rose again the third day. You say it was all according to the scripture, all prophesied and promised and then proven. And tonight there's forgiveness for believers. If we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There's hope and forgiveness for the unbeliever, the foreigner, the one who's not an insider, who doesn't feel connected to you or to us or anywhere. If they confess their sin, you're faithful and just to forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. So wherever you're at, wherever you're sitting right now, I want to say God so loved you, he sent his son to suffer and die for your sins. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. He's already paid so you don't have to pay. He already died so you don't have to die. He died so you could live but you have to say yes to the Lord tonight. And if you're ready to do that, especially if it's for the very first time, I'd ask you to raise your hand and to hold it high. Let me pray with you right now, introducing you to the one who gave his life so you could have life, life eternal, life abundant, life in him, real life, the life he's intended and made possible in his son. Anyone tonight, Anyone this hour, don't leave this place without settling up with him, without surrendering your life to him. Lord, you're searching our hearts, and I pray you'd continue as we prepare to take the bread and the cup. Don't let anybody resist. Oh, Lord, I know they can. I, I know you won't force them, but just show them, open their eyes to the, the, the terror of what lies ahead or the wonder of what you've planned and purposed instead. In Jesus' name, amen.